Hello everyone, I'm Tracy Koga and welcome to Hue at Home. While we all know our own beliefs begin at a very early age, shaped from our parents and family environment, as we grow older and expand our circle, our beliefs can change. That's going to be a reoccurring theme on today's show. You're going to meet some incredible people that have redirected their own lives for the better and along the way changed their beliefs. We have another edition of Let's Get Your Human back again with Robin Priest, this time in conversation with Amanda Outhwaite. And then our life coach, Linda Drostowicz, will tell us more on how we can create new beliefs. But first, I'll sit down with jazz recording artist Seraphine Lavriviere. They will talk about music, but more importantly, family and what it really truly means to them. I am getting to love this Zoom because I am getting to meet such incredible people from all over Canada, all over the world, but I want to say hello to Seraphine Lafren La Riviere. Did I pronounce it right, Seraphine? Yep, La Riviere, <laughs> that's just perfect. <laughs> and right now you're in Toronto, but you said that you commute between Toronto and Montreal, and where else do you call Actually, home? Toronto and um, between Toronto and a little tiny village in North ha called North Hatley in the Eastern Townships. Ah, oh, beautiful. Um, which has like a population of 400 year round, and then in the summertime it goes up to like 3,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, and that's but, when you're not so, there so, anymore, no. <laughs> no, I've, I've, I was actually writing out most of COVID there and I wrote oh. half of the album and arranged the music of the album in there because we were in the middle of this village in the middle of nowhere during a pandemic. So, yeah, but no, I don't don't make it into Montreal too much. Quebec City, I sing there quite a bit during pre-COVID times. Oh, so. yes. OK, so let's talk about the album. And like you and so many other singer songwriters and artists, uh, 2020 was a lot of writing. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of isolation so this album what kind of obviously what kind of songs motivated you and then now I guess getting this album released is kind of different too as well correct oh it's crazy um I had actually planned to record the album uh back a year ago in, in the end of March uh, in 2020 and then of course you know all heck mm -hmm. broke loose and um it was interesting because I, I hadn't written music. My last album was 10 years before, and I had taken kind of a hiatus because we adopted our son. And, um, you know, for any new parents out there, <laughs> you know what it's like trying to juggle bathing with child <laughs> with childbearing, never mind a career. So I was doing gigs in Quebec. I have an agent in Quebec City, and I was doing gigs there, but mostly I was at home. And... I hadn't written any music and so I thought I'll include two originals that I wrote quite some time before and then I'll just do cover songs and kind of arrange those mm -hmm. a little bit differently. And when COVID hit, you know, because I'm normally a jazz artist, I I felt like all the rules had just been tossed out the window, mm -hmm. you know, and and so I, I started arranging the songs, the jazz covers that I was doing sort of in different ways, borrowing from, you know, country and pop and and um soul and funk and then i started writing and i wrote because i had this terrible parenting day like you know those days where you're just like you might as well just start putting money in the account for your child's therapy a year later on you know <laughs> let I, alone yours I was, oh i was homeschooling and any parent out there that had to do that deserves every amount of adulation that there is in this planet. Um, I'd had a terrible day. My my adoptive mom had died and I needed advice and she wasn't there. And I was downstairs and I wrote this song called Mom. It's actually the next single we'll be releasing uh, later this month. And it opened this gate for me of writing about, uh, about fear and, and about comfort and solace as well mm -hmm. and uh, I wrote these very sort of personal songs and and it informed the way I sang the songs that I had chosen for the album I ended up writing six songs and then kept losing standards as, as I went along <laughs> and uh, yeah it was a very powerful time I actually really I know I'll remember that period for for, for my life that was it was really powerful for me and it was interesting going back as you were talking about you're kind of throwing your normal jazz go to into other different genres and I really kind of think music especially this year took that plunge well, like there is crossovers 
galore and you know you, you artists that you would normally hear on a country station you hear on pop and then pop would be country or rock and I, I think it's beautiful um, your experience I guess getting into these different genres too probably was uplifting for yourself to even as an artist it was great because what I did was I was listening. To, I don't know about you, but for me, nostalgia was huge during the mm -hmm. pandemic. Those things that bring us comfort. So I was watching the Mary Tyler Moore show, and, <laughs> but I was also listening to old LPs that I had because I had a little record player. And I was listening to the LPs that I used to listen to, oh, the songs on the LPs that I used to listen to over and over and over again. And I started thinking, what do I like about this song? What is it that, you know... All these years later, I still listen to it and think, oh, my God, that's perfect. Um, and, and so it made me, it forced me to sort of look outside of the genres because I have such a disparate um, taste in music over my lifetime because I'm older and, and you know, our tastes change as time goes on. Um, and, and, and then other artists were doing things, crazy things. Taylor Swift released a folk album. Yeah. Mm -hmm. which was, stunning it was stunning and um uh lila bialy released a beautiful album she's traditionally very jazz and her album just spans the the, the breadth of genre um so yeah it was it was an, a, a lawless year <laughs> <laughs> and will you go back to jazz and and we have to say that jazz really is a is a niche kind of genre it hasn't mm -hmm. seen the growth like what we call pop music and um, all the artists are so unique in themselves and great storytellers, which I probably think is really important for you, right, Seraphin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love jazz, especially the American Songbook. By American, I mean the North American Songbook, which mm -hmm. is the classics from, you know, Cole Porter and, and Noel Coward and, and, you know, stuff that Bing Crosby sang and, and uh, um, Rosemary Clooney, those kind of songs. And, you know, you listen to those and you think, I did one of Rosemary Clooney's songs on the album, not, not one of her songs, but one of her signature pieces called You Came a Long Way from St. Louis. And it is the best, most badass song you can imagine <laughs> for the 1950s. You know, there, you know, it's just uh, it's amazing to discover how common the the, the lyrical threads are mm -hmm. them and now and oh, yes. rediscovering the, the, those meanings. I yeah, find that very powerful. And you can understand every single word that they're singing. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> oh my God! Thank heavens for lyric. What is it? Lyrics. Easylyrics.com, where you can just punch in and find yeah. out what what the heck Elton John was singing in 1974 <laughs> through a haze of quaaludes and <laughs> you know, like, oh, it's a tiny oh. dancer. <laughs> yes, really. Yes. Um, yeah. So I want to go um, um, to you personally. Uh, mm. You did mention that you took a 10-year hiatus to, and, you know, you have a son who is now 10 yeah. years old, Nikki, and Nikki. It, it is a real journey, like amazing journey that you've taken, Seraphin, and I think it is something that, uh, if you're willing to, I don't know, but share, because it is a powerful sure. story, and, it, I mean, a great ending, too. It's, um, it is a continual a revelation every day, and I don't use that word lightly or, or glibly. When you sit and you look at this person who is becoming, you know, now he's pre-adolescent, he's 10, and I'm looking at him and seeing the human being that he is becoming and rising to be, and it's frightening because I think, oh God, don't screw this up. <laughs> but also it's amazing because, you know, he's not just like people. <laughs> he's got his own personality and his own... And I can remember the traits that he had as a child, as an infant, and and see how they've sort of grown through time. And it's been a very powerful journey. And because we waited so long for him, because the adoption process is long, and it, we adopted him in the province of Saskatchewan. We were living there for a short time, and they made it so easy. But even still, it was a two-year process. And, um, you know, we were told that we would have a hard time adopting because we're not a typical uh, heterosexual couple. Um, not a typical normative family, um, and they took extra good care of us. Um, the, 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 you know, we hear about red tape, the bureaucracy, bureaucracy in, in, in Saskatchewan and Regina, the social services were amazingly supportive. Mm. Um, Canada has safeguards to prevent 
abuses of prejudice and abuses of exclusion, which I was so proud of to learn. I get emotional. I think about it when I think how their main focus is having a child in a home. Mm -hmm. That's it. They want a child in a home. And uh, so, so that process of, of getting a child doing the, we had to do nine months of coursework and learning and classes and, and then waiting. And then we, we ended up fostering Nikki at first and it was nine months of nail biting. Oh, will the adoption go through nine months long? And um, I think I kept the potato chip companies in business. Like <laughs> it was just to heck with the pandemic. That was the big one. Um, and when it arrived, it arrived, the, the, the slip from the, the uh, judge arrived on my birthday on June 7th. Oh, wow. And I know. And I looked at it and I was like, I don't need anything else. <laughs> no. No, that's so, yeah. No, that 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 is so amazing, and and I guess now too, obviously, life has changed, right? You're a parent, and there's certain things you just can't go run out and do a gig anymore. It's like a lot of no. planning before you step out of that door. And ironically, you know, COVID has actually been—I shouldn't say COVID—isolation has been kind of um, good for that, I suppose, or kind of conducive to that because. I can't go out and do a little tour right now. I can't go and do a bunch of gigs to to release the album, which I would actually love to do. And I take my kid along and I give him my phone because he never gets to play video games. And I'm like, here, you can play a game on my phone. And of course, it's like crack cocaine to children, yes. right? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, um, so, but but it has changed the way I, I have released an album. And I've never had that happened before I just get notices oh CBC is playing your album and Jazz <laughs> FM is playing your album and oh these people are buying it and Bandcamp it went up live on Bandcamp and it had 900 listens within an eight-hour period and now it's at like almost 4,000 wow. and the music video for Take On Me that I released yes. back in December that I shot myself and edited <laughs> and, <laughs> well, and hey. it's got 40,000 views on YouTube so but I haven't left my house <laughs> so there you go. No. I, it, I know it, it is it is a real kind of a, a weird kind of situation because we yeah. all want to see you live. Like I would love to see you live, but mm. if I can see a video, I'll take that. And it's so yeah. strange. Yeah. So I guess moving on, Seraphin, looking into the future, uh, obviously writing more music. Mm -hmm. Will you still continue in the jazz? Or will you maybe become something else? You know, that's a really good question. I think I will always, you know, five of the songs on the album are from a jazz sort of ethos. Um, but I think, you know, I've always had kind of a hard time fitting with jazz. I've had, you know... I've had been been embraced in in San Francisco and in Toronto and 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 uh, in Quebec, mm -hmm. um, but it, I'm always a little bit different because my voice is kind of unusual and and uh, I don't know. It'll be interesting, and I can't scat to <laughs> save my life. I sound like a child burbling into their cereal. Like it just it's not good. Um, so I don't know. I, I think I would like to sit where I am for a while, which is straddling a bunch of different fences and see. Well, see how that goes yeah well i think that's a good place to be so i am hoping that you are going to give us a song yes i would love to the the single the first single we released in december which was released on a whim i i was bored and <laughs> <laughs> wanted to do something and um we did this video and i learned how to edit and um and it did really well so i'm and ironically it's not jazz at all so oh so I'd love to sing that for you if you're okay. It's it's one of my favorite songs from the 1980s because mm -hmm. I'm an 80s kid, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it was done in a very sort of pop sort of way. And my first album 15 15 years ago was all pop songs redone as jazz tunes. But I wanted to take a pop song and do it as sort of a torch song, as a a quiet, intense sort of piece. And so I took "Take on Me" from the Ha. <gasps> Uh -huh. and remember that video with the like yes. the cartoons, the like, all sketchy cartoons, and like yes. oh. big hair. hair. And, oh, it's great! <laughs> <laughs> so I redid it, and it, you know what? The song holds up so well. I watched the video, and I was like, "This video is amazing." Video. 
Well, there you go. Um, so I got the rights and I, yeah, I recorded it. So, so yeah, I'd love to do that for you. Okay. Thank you so much, Seraphin. Seraphin oh, La Riviere, so we love you in Winnipeg. Can't wait to have you here perform live. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> to remember you shine away I'm still coming for you one day
Welcome back to Heal at Home. Linda will be coming by shortly with more on how we can change the way we think and create new beliefs. But right now, let's have another edition of Let's Get Your Human Back Again. Welcome to another edition of Let's Get Our Human Back Again with our host, Robin Priest. And today's guest, let's just say that she wants to help, really, really help. So it's all about finding our great human traits, getting us to be, again, um, you know, sharing the love. Right, Robin? Absolutely. And, and thanks for having us again. Tracy, I just, uh, I love this series of being able to have a discussion about something so simple that I think sometimes we forget just about getting our human back again, right? Sometimes I think we've lost it in this crazy world and we think it's, it used to have to be fast paced, go, go, go. And now we've slowed down and we, we actually have the ability to take a look and think about what's important and I think what's important is being able to connect with people even when we can't always physically be with them but uh, I'm super excited that we've got Amanda Althwaite with us today who's just going to share some of her story and what she's come through and where she is now and I'm like an inspiration because I know how much she wants to get out there and, and give back to the community. So Amanda, take it away. Uh, hello everybody, I'm Amanda Othwaite. Um, I'm currently looking into becoming a peer support worker, um, starting in with volunteering. Um, I'm super passionate about getting out there to help people. I know my struggles started at a young age um, with addiction um, when I was 14 years old and battled with that up until four or five years ago, just dealing with it, getting through it. Um, and it was a hard struggle. Um, just people looking down on you for the addiction, not having the supports there for you. Um, when I first went to rehab, my counselor that I was working with had never done drugs, never done any of that. And I kind of looked at her and I'm like, what do you know? Like, I'm sorry, like you, you're probably very smart. You know the books and everything. But when it comes down to my addiction and what I was addicted to, it's just not the same. And I just had a hard time really listening to her and taking advice from her. Um, so unfortunately that one didn't work out. I um, ended up relapsing and going back and using again um, until I met um, a counselor at another rehab that was a recovering alcoholic. Okay, so maybe she wasn't an addict, like a drug addict, but addiction's addiction. And for me, it just helped me understood helped me know that she knew what I was going through inside she knew the struggles of addiction she knew the depression um just of how to overcome it um so I found that really comforting and just easy to listen to her because she knew what I was going through um so with all my addictions and everything like struggling over the years and just having people look down on you and not ask you why like what happened what made you go into this and understand why I was using drugs yes I was using it at the time to mask the pain inside me i um, dealing with different mental illnesses different struggles in life um, people don't always become addicts because they just try one day and it's fine no they're masking something they're trying to hide pain at least that's what I was doing personally and um, so it was nice to finally have somebody to ask me why and want to know why rather than just why are you doing what you're doing? Like looking down on me, they actually kind of cared a little bit more about it. Um, so that's what I want to do. I want to go out there and let people know that anybody can change. You can do it when you're ready to change. Um, because and I'm so grateful for Robin yourself. Um, having this um, program for peer supports, the introduction to peer supports, because I think it's going to open up a lot of doors for people that want to help. I was grateful enough before this pandemic that one of my friends, Amy, um, told me about this program. If it wasn't for her, 
I would, I, I don't know if I would have known about it. So she brought it up to me telling me all about it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have wanted to help people for such a long time. And you have given me the opportunity, um, the tools to do it. So, and it's just changing my outlook on life already about people in general and what's going on in our city. <laughs> like, it's, it's so sad. I was driving down the street down the street and like I always carry granola bars in my car with me and I give them out and like just the homeless people like living in our bus shelters and it just hurts my heart I just want to save everybody and help everybody I know I can't do that all by myself but um but it's it's hard like um seeing people with addictions and not getting the right resources they need the right counseling they need the right support they need Wow. Yes. So how did you get to know Robin? Um, well, yeah, I got to know her from taking her peer support program, which I absolutely love from my friend that referred me to it. Um, and I took that course and it was amazing. It opened up a lot of doors for me and just made me think about the way to help people. Cause I had the tools of, um, of understanding what I went through, but it's communicating with other people that are going through those things. I didn't have the right tools to communicate back and forth. Um, so I learned, I got introduced to Robin that way. And I'm so grateful. She's an amazing person. Robin Preece, Live Your Truth is amazing. I highly speak of it to anybody I run into. Um, and I think she's just doing amazing things here in the city. Robin, how important or I guess it will be very, it is very important um, for a peer support worker to have a lived experience. I mean, Amanda touched on it, but uh, I'd like to hear your side of it. Sure, I think for me, um, peer is like about having some common experience. And I think we can be peers in a range of different things. Like peer support isn't just peer support in mental health or peer support in addictions. There are peer workers in um, like cancer survivor groups. There are peer workers in uh, diabetes support groups, brain injury support groups. I think mothers and babies is an absolute peer to peer experience. So I think when we look at mental health and addiction, it's gotta be someone who's had some kind of mental health or addiction issue. And I know that there are a number of workers in the field who have their own experience, but they're still bound by the code of ethics and the job description. If they're a social worker, case manager, psychiatrist, whatever, if they can share some of their experience, that's great. But peer worker roles are designed around the code of conduct that there is for peer workers. They're based around a set of values specific to peer workers. So it's super important. Um, there's peer workers now going into emergency rooms, into crisis centres, into inpatient units. Um, there's peer workers around the world working in the justice system. So it's people who've gone through the justice system with their own experience of mental health or addiction too. And I think it's critical because you can have, I, like I know for me when I talk to people who are feeling suicidal, I can share about when I was feeling suicidal, when I attempted, you know, to kill myself and what I was feeling afterwards. Like, I'm super glad I am crap at killing myself because I'm still here and I have this amazing life. So it really is the ability to share from our experiences that connection. And I, I said, you know, in, a, in another one of these conversations about the camaraderie. Um, but I think one of the important things, it's not about just sharing from our experience, it's knowing how to share effectively. Because if we share all the war and gory and illness bits, like it, it can be pretty tough for the person we're sharing with. So I think one of the cool things is I get to support people to kind of A, look at themselves, because I've heard like from many people who have done the course, 
they've had so much personal growth. I actually heard from a clinician, they've never been grilled personally as much as they have in our peer training, which was interesting. But you get to know yourself, you have a different ability mm -hmm. to support someone on their journey. And you know, it's not about telling someone what to do, because we've all been told what to do. And we're all like, bugger off, I don't want to do what you want to do. When I'm ready, I will step into my future. So wow. it, it's amazing, yeah. No, it is. Um, Amanda, going back to you talking about your addiction, that truly is, I guess, uh, a, an ongoing battle, correct? Or have... It is. Uh, like, I feel like today I can say I'm fully recovered. Like, for mm -hmm. me to ever go back, no, because I know how much it affected my life before and where I am today. And I see the personal growth I have grown today. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would ever jeopardize where I am in my life today for my addiction. Um, I have a wonderful family, a supportive family that have been there. My children, um, they've seen me go through it all. And I feel like it's only made them stronger. Um, so for me to fall back into it, I think that would be, a huge step back and I think I've grown too much to allow myself I can't never's a long time but in my heart I'm pretty sure it'll never happen again because I just I'm very happy where I am in life now and I feel like I'm strong enough to and I think if I if I had any doubts that it may come back that may put me in a vulnerable spot to look into being a peer support worker because I wouldn't want to put myself into those situations Mm -hmm. Because I'm going in, I'm going to be working with people battling with addic uh, sorry, addictions. Um, and I want to make sure that I'm strong and confident and showing them like my positive experience. Like, yes, I've had relapses in the past. Um, I feel like that's a part of your recovery. Relapses are going to happen, mm -hmm. but I find they make you a stronger person in the long run. And I'm grateful for them because they've taught me taught me where I want to be and who I want to be in life. So I, I'm finally ready to share my story. It's taken me a long time and, and probably in the last year, I'm ready to share it and ready to help more people with, with their addictions and mental health. Oh, that is so amazing. <laughs> uh, quickly to you, Amanda, how much did your children play, your family play in making sure that this was the road to recovery? Um, they, they did a huge part. Like my kids were younger when it first happened. Um, and I did lose them for a year. Um, I did, I did fight for them back. I, it took me a year to get them back. So I'm really grateful. It took me six months of finally deciding, okay, it's finally time to clean up. And that's when I really put my foot down. Um, but they've impacted me a lot because that would be my biggest fear losing them again. And I know if I, went back into addictions, I, I would probably hurt my family just because they've seen what I went through before in my addictions, um, how my mental stability was. And I just, I don't want to put anybody through that again. So I just want to be a strong, be a warrior. So. <laughs> well, you've got a great teacher in Robin. Sure so, do, yeah. I mean, this again is another kind of happy ending story, Robin. So they're really, I guess, you know, proof in the pudding that peer support does work? Uh, I think it does. I, th I think the issue for me is the world doesn't know enough about peer support. They don't hear about it enough. It's random how people hear about it. I think the piece for me is let's talk it up. Let's share about it because it's one of those pieces that makes a huge difference. But most people never hear about it. And so... Part of what I want to do is make sure people hear more about it. You know what, Amanda, thank you so much for sharing your story. And in this too, like we only hope that it gives enough courage for other people to come forward and share their story too, because we have said it before, we just want everybody to know that you're not alone. Right, Amanda? And that's so true. Like I think the biggest part of my journey has been me sharing my story and just knowing that people out there are grateful for it. Um, and I think it's a huge thing that everybody should share their story. You are not alone out there. There's so many others that are dealing with the exact same thing 
and we could all work together and make it work and just make everybody better. So, well, watch out, peer support is going to take over the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <For all. laughs> oh. Well, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Robin. And Thanks, uh, let's get on our way to making this a better world, correct? Peer support all over. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Hey everyone, happy to be here. I want to talk today about creating new beliefs and really to have the understanding that beliefs are just thoughts we have over and over. And to understand that means that we can change those beliefs because we can change our thoughts. Thoughts are not just, they don't just have to appear unwillingly in your head all the time, we can create intentionally new thoughts to think so that we can energize ourselves, create things, try new things, practice new things. It all comes from our thoughts. Now, how do you change a thought? That's a great question. I'll give you an example for myself. I used to have the thought in my head all the time that I don't finish things I start. This thought may have been born from, you know, when I was younger and I, I would try things and not finish them. However, having that thought did not serve me at all because when that thought would appear in my head, I would feel deflated and, you know, oh, that's right and disappointed in myself. It certainly was not an energizing thought. So I intentionally went to change that thought. I thought, well, what would energize me? What would make me feel strong? And one thought that I came up with is, I finish what I start. A simple thought, but what I would find is when I would think that thought, I finish what I start, I would feel proud, I would feel confident, I would feel certain, I would feel like I had my own back, which is such a important part of our lives is feeling like we've got our own backs. If we fail, if we stumble, if we fall, knowing we've got our own backs is so important. So by shifting that thought, I was able to finish things. What are the odds? It really is amazing to see thought work and how it plays out in our lives. It's not easy. The first step for changing a thought is to be aware of it. Become aware of those thoughts that, you know, don't serve you any longer, that are just repetitive, that keep you feeling stuck and, and small. And to notice those thoughts and then take the shift to changing them. It's an amazing tool. It is, it will drive your results that you want to get in your life by changing those thoughts and making new beliefs. So try it. It's, uh, it's an amazing tool and really is the key to unlocking so much of our success, so much of our futures, so much of our action uh, is to uh, make our thoughts intentional. I want to give a very special thank you to all of our guests on today's show and leave you with this question. What is one belief that you would like to change? We want to know, so send us an email to hello at ilikehugh.com or you can message us on Facebook and Instagram at ilikehugh. But for now, stay safe and healthy and we'll see you next time on Hugh at Home.